Good afternoon, guys. Uh, we're going to start the new system today, and this is respiratory system part one. And part two will cover in next class. So today's uh, the chapter objective is to describe the structure and function of the conducting and respiratory zone. So in the respiratory system, uh, the organs, the anatomy can be divided into two groups. That is called the conducting zone of the respiratory tract and respiratory zone. So conducting zone, conduct the air from your nose to the other parts of the respiratory tract, just help in flowing the air. That is called conducting zone. And the respiratory zones are the area of the respiratory tract where you can exchange the gases. Uh, we will explain the physical aspect of ventilation. So ventilation is inhalation and exhalation. What physics and physical structure works in inspiration and expiration? I will go over that. And then that's the uh, mechanics of breathing in relation to inspiration and expiration. Like what is the, the pressure and volume chains and why that happens during the breathing. Uh, to test and identify the function of the ventilation, means flow of air through the respiratory tracts, we perform pulmonary function tests. Sometimes we call it sp spirometry. So we will talk about pulmonary function test, their parameters and what happens in certain kind of disease like obstructive and restrictive lung disorder, okay? So let's start with the uh, general overview of the respiration or respiratory system. So when the term respiration comes, the literal meaning of respiration is to exchange gases, okay? So where we can exchange gases, someone from you guys, like where in our body, because we all have done basic biology, you should know where is the exchange of gases in our body? In the lungs. In the lungs, one. Capillary beds. Capillary beds that is in the lungs and what other location of the capillary beds? Body tissues. Body tissues. Good. So, and then is there anything else inside the cell exchange of gases? Yes, we use oxygen when you have oxidative phosphorylation respiration inside the mitochondria, and then we produce carbon dioxide and water. So there is another use of oxygen in producing carbon dioxide. So three location, okay? So when there is exchange of gas between the pulmonary capillaries in the lungs, and when there is exchange of gases between the systemic capillaries in the tissues, and when there is exchange of gases inside the mitochondria. They all are respiration, but they have different names. So let's see, what are they? Before that, <clears throat> when we breathe in respiration, air is getting inside, that is inhalation. And when he, air comes out, that is exhalation. And both getting air in and getting air out are ventilation. When air reaches the lungs, particularly in the alveolus, then there is exchange of gases. So from inhaled air, we take oxygen and send to the pulmonary capillaries. And we take carbon dioxide from the pulmonary capillaries, comes into your lungs and you exhale them, okay? Now, once pulmonary capillaries, so that exchange of gas, you see gas exchange in the alveoli, that is called 
external respiration. Are you following me? A student get confused external respiration with the ventilation. Are you following me? So air getting in and out through the respiratory tract is not the respiration, that is ventilation. Respiration is when we exchange gas in the alveoli, clear? So when, let's see, oxygen is getting in our pulmonary capillaries from the alveoli and the carbon dioxide from the pulmonary capillaries in the alveoli, that is external respiration. Make, write down, note, what is the difference between external respiration and ventilation? Okay, so ventilation moves air in and out of the lungs for gas exchange with blood. That is external respiration. Now, you know from the cardiovascular system, when gas diffuse from your alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries, then the oxygen binds with RBC, particularly hemoglobin, and then it moves from there with the blood to the left atrium, from the left atrium, left ventricle, from the left ventricle, aorta, and all over the body. Clear? Now, once it goes all over the body, what happens to the aorta? Aorta has like thousands of branching. Ultimately, aorta becomes capillaries. And then those capillaries exchange the gas. So gas exchange between blood and tissues, or particularly the cells, is called internal respiration, which is O2 used by tissues. And then gas exchange inside the mitochondria of a cell, like a neuron, a skeletal muscle, that is called cellular respiration. So what we did here, terminologies, pointed out, ventilation, external respiration, internal respiration, and cellular respiration. It is cellular respiration which makes ATP, okay? And these all exchange of gas happens through the passive diffusion because due to increased pressure, partial pressure of one type of gas, one side more compared to other side, it diffuses through the membrane, okay? So respiratory system can be divided into the conducting zone, and respiratory zone. But before that, I want you guys to know the organs of the respiratory system. So organs start from your nose or mouth, nasal cavity, then in the neck, pharynx, larynx, trachea. Trachea divide into two main bronchi. That is called primary bronchi. And then secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, then bronchioles, and then bronchioles divide further into terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles, and then ultimately alveolar shack, and then alveoli. So you see here, conducting zone are the region of respiratory tract which do not exchange gases, which only help in flowing the gases. So conducting zone, here is your nose, nasopharynx, larynx, then trachea, then primary bronchus. Primary bronchus now enters the lungs, secondary bronchus here too, tertiary bronchus. And they look like a tree root. So we call them bronchial tree. And then ultimately they become terminal bronchioles. So up to terminal bron bronchioles, you see how many branching are there? From one trachea to 60,000 branching. And these branching are covered by connective tissue and other stuff and that becomes the lungs. So lungs are just the supporting tissues with all these branching, okay? Okay, so now the respiratory zone 
start from after the term terminal bronchioles, we have respiratory bronchioles. So respiratory bronchioles are the respiratory zone. Trunk terminal bronchioles are not, they are in the conducting zone, okay? So respiratory bronchioles, then you see there is ballooning up. Those balloon-like structures are the alveolus, singular and alveoli, plural. These alveoli are attached to the alveolar duct and whole duct and a lot of alveoli is called alveolar sac. By the time your trachea turn into alveolar, there is 8 million branching. So you know, we have more than 8 million alveoli in our lungs, each lung. And this area is called respiratory zone because this area can exchange gases with the pulmonary capillaries around here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so that is the conducting zone on respiratory zone. Now let's see then how respiratory zone help in exchanging the gases. To understand that, we have to understand the histology of the alveoli. So here is alveoli. And if I take and do a transverse section here and remove this upper part and see inside the alveoli, what are you gonna see? Let's see here. So we have cut through the alveoli and then you can see the section of the alveoli. And once you understand one alveoli function, you're gonna understand the function of all the lungs. So here, in this transverse section of the alveolus, we can see several alveoli and the capillaries around it. So here, this is one alveoli partial section. Here, this is one whole alveoli, alveolus. Then there is another partial section of alveolus. Here is another partial section wall of the alveolus. And outside the alveoli, the pulmonary artery capillaries, which we call them, pulmonary capillaries are this one. Inside the pulmonary capillaries, you see there is red blood cells. Okay, here is another capillary, here is another capillary. So let's understand the wall of the alveoli. So wall of the alveoli here is made up of simple squamous epithelium. You see, there is one cell, it's nucleus, there is another cell, there is another cell, there is another cell. And then it is supported by the connective tissue. As you know, any epithelial tissue are supported by connective tissue. So you see basement membrane here. So inside this alveoli, alveoli are made up of type one alveolar cell, which is simple squamous cells. Then type two alveolar cells, some of them, which is rough border, large nuclei, type two alveolar cells. And inside the cavity of the alveoli, there is another wandering moving cells. This is macrophage, big eater. So this type two alveolar, type one alveolar cell, you see there is blue lining. That is the fluid secreted by, secreted by type two alveolar cell. And that is called surfactant. We're gonna talk about that later. So this is lining. If let's see this cell is not functioning, then this lining will be covered by water produced by type one alveolar cell. And when water makes covers a membrane inside, what does water do? Each water molecule are connected to each other by hydrogen bonding and that creates a surface tension and that try to collapse the alveoli. Are you following me? 
So to prevent that collapse, the cell produce surfactant, which prevent collapsing. We're gonna talk about that. So this is alveoli. Here is the capillaries. Now see here, between these type one alveolar cell here, plasma membrane, and this is blood capillary endothelial cell. So there is two cell thick membrane with basement membrane. And this is the thinnest area where oxygen from alveoli, oxygen from alveoli will enter the capillaries and carbon dioxide from the capillaries will get inside the alveoli. That's how gas exchange takes place in the lungs. Do you guys have any question here? I want you to understand because this is the physiology of respiratory system. Okay. So now, <clears throat> so that is where the, uh, the, the gas exchange takes place. And we're gonna talk about that later in the gas analysis area, okay? So now the ventilation. Uh, in, let's talk about the ventilation. And to understand the ventilation, we have to understand the structure of the lungs. Let me draw here. So we have like two lungs, both side. We have one lung here and we have another lung, this side. Each lung is covered by a membrane. Let's see different color. the red membrane, which is attached to the wall. And this is so hard. And then there is another outer membrane, which is attached to the body cavity wall. So you see, this is called pleura. This two membrane is called pleura. The inner red lining, which is attached to the lung tissue is called visceral pleura and the outer membrane is called parietal pleura. And the space, this two pleura is called pleural space. That is in our thoracic cavity. So the membrane which is attached to the lungs is called visceral pleura, and the membrane which is attached to the body wall is called parietal pleura. And this space is pleural cavity. In this cavity, there is some space fluid, okay? And the function of this fluid is to prevent rubbing of the two membranes and the lungs, okay? So how we breathe? First, I explain any terminology. I am charging you with the information. We breathe in because we have less pressure inside our thoracic cavity and we breathe out Expiration, because we have more pressure inside the lungs. So, if I say our lungs are covered by completely, so you, if you have a balloon, big balloon, large balloon, and you push your lungs inside the balloon, and then cover with the balloon, fuse the balloon completely, so let's say this is a balloon and here's lungs and your lungs is covered by the balloon. Then you know there are two layers of the balloon which covers the lungs. Are you following me? So to understand the function of the inhalation and exhalation, we have a space between the pleura that is called pleural space and the pressure inside the pleura, pleural cavity is called intra Plural pressure. Are you following me? And the pressure inside the lungs or alveoli is 
intrapulmonary pressure. And the pressure difference between these two are called transpulmonary pressure. Okay? So let's read it and I'm going to explain. During inspiration, intrapulmonary pressure is about negative three. Here, pressure are negative and positive. Negative is less than atmospheric pressure and positive is more than atmospheric pressure. So pressure of the environment, atmosphere is 760 millimeter of mercury at sea level. It will change when you go high mountains and it will go down when you go deep uh, inside the ocean. Are you following me? So let's see here. During inspiration, intrapulmonary pressure is about three, negative three millimeter of mercury. That means during the inspiration, the pressure inside the lung is three less than the atmospheric pressure. Whereas during expiration, that pressure is positive three plus three millimeter of mercury. That means three more compared to the atmospheric pressure. That's why pressure come, uh, the air comes outside, okay? But what is the pressure inside the lungs? So let's see if our lungs contract and exhale air, it will remain collapse. Does that remain collapse? No. Around the lungs, we have a pleural cavity and we have pressure inside the pleural cavity that is called intrapleural pressure. Ibn, so during inspiration, intrapleural pressure is a lot more negative than intrapulmonary pressure and the atmospheric pressure. Even before during expiration, the pressure inside the pleural cavity is negative. That's why after the expiration, lungs again expand. Are you following me? And keeping this expand helps intrapleural pressure as well as the surfactant, which we're gonna see later, okay? So take home message here. We breathe in because of negative pressure. We breathe out because of positive pressure inside the lungs. Our lungs are always inflated because intrapleural pressure are always negative, whether it is during inspiration or during inspiration. Okay, that means it is always less than atmospheric pressure. So <clears throat> ventilation results from pressure difference induced by change in lung volume. Air moves from higher to lower pressure and that happens because there is compliance and elasticity of the lung tissue. Plus the surface tension inside the alveolar wall in the inner surface of alveolar wall, okay? So surface tension, compliance and elasticity is ventilation of the lungs. Let's go how. Compliance is when your chest expand, then your lungs also expand. And that is compliance. That's the natural characteristic of the lung tissue due to elastic fiber inside it. And when it expand, after you exhale, it comes back, it recoil, that is elastic property of the elasticity property of the lungs tissue. When are the <clears throat> lungs collapse, then what happens? In the lungs, there is surface tension due to the water molecule produced by type one alveolar cell. And if the lungs, let's see, collapse during the exhalation, it will be collapse. But to prevent that, type two alveolar cells in the alveoli also produce surfactant and that reduce surface tension of the lungs, okay? So when it needs to collapse during the exhalation, surface tension works. When it had to expand, it prevented by surfactant, okay? 
Sometimes what happens inside the pleural cavity around these lungs, air build up and the air inside the intrapleural space is called pneumothorax, okay? So compliance is distensibility, elasticity is tendency to recoil after distension. Surface tension is the force directed inward which reduces distension, that is surface tension. Surface tension always against the compliance and surfactant reduce surface tension which prevents alveoli from collapsing after the exhalation, okay? So both are needed in normal amount. Okay, so surface tension and surfactant. Surface tension and elasticity are forces that promote alveoli collapse and resist distension. Lungs secrete, particularly the type one alveolar cell and absorb fluid normally, leaving a thin film of fluid on alveolar surface. This film causes surface tension because H2O molecules are attracted to each other by uh, two other H2O molecules through the hydrogen bonding and surface tension acts to collapse alveoli, thus increasing pressure of alveoli, alveoli within, uh, of air within the alveoli, which help in exhaling air during expiration. And to again recoil surface surfactant works, okay? So surfactant are produced by type two alveolar cells. So what is surfactant? These surfactant are fatty substance produced by this type two alveolar cell. And you see this blue color fluid is covering the surface of the sub, uh, type two alveolar cell as well as the alveolar surface, okay? This surfactant lowers surface tension by getting between H2O molecules, reducing their ability to attract each other via hydrogen bonding, okay? So it breaks down the hydrogen bonding. Uh, have you heard about the disease called respiratory distress syndrome? and acute respiratory distress syndrome and IRDS, infant respiratory distress syndrome. So let's see a newborn baby. Their lungs are not mature. That means type two alveolar cells are not mature. And then you have a reduced amount of surfactant. If that is the situation, what will happen to the alveolar wall? Um, it'll collapse. It'll collapse. It will the lungs collapse. will collapse. Mm -hmm. And if lungs collapse, baby will die like a fox season. So what do we do? If the baby is coming earlier, before 34 weeks, we get ready for everything like pressure ventilation, uh, we give artificial surfactant, we give some medication which increase the surfactant production, and we keep the baby in ICU till baby's type two alveolar cells develop, okay? That condition is called IRDS, Infant Respiratory Distress Syndrome, okay? So what are those phospholipid produced by type two alveolar cell? They are two fat substance, fatty substance. They are called lecithin and phosphatidylcholine. So in the short answer question, if I ask, write a name of one surfactant, you can write either of them, phosphatidylcholine or lecithin. Now, there is another condition which is called acute respiratory distress syndrome. How that happens? Um, so, Professor, this... can you go back to the other slide real quick so I can write down the second type? This one? Or this um, one? The one with the two types of surfactant at the bottom? Yeah, that's the one. Thank you. Oh, okay. thanks, Britton. Okay. Okay, thank you. Somebody has, Britton has already written in chat. Thank you. So here, Surfactant is lecithin and phosphatidylcholine. Okay, so next condition can be acute respiratory distress syndrome. 
So infant respiratory distress syndrome was due to lack of surfactant. In the adult respiratory distress syndrome, same thing can happen in the adult, but due to different region. There will be lungs collapse, but the cause will be different. So let's see if somebody has septicemia and bacteremia. You know septic shock, that means when bacterial or viral toxin is spread in your body, in your blood, then your blood vessel becomes leaky. And the plasma fluid from your blood vessel leak into this connected tissue and then into the alveoli. So now fluid is adding up in the alveoli and that will dilute your surfactant. So earlier there was lack of surfactant, now you are diluting the surfactant. And water molecule is coming all out here. They are forming the hydrogen bonding and collapsing the lungs and alveoli. That is called surfactant, uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome. Everybody is clear what is infant respiratory distress syndrome and adult respiratory distress syndrome. IRDS and ARDS. Oh, okay. Professor? Uh huh. Just to clarify what you just said. So, for, for the babies, the respiratory distress syndrome is that there's not enough of the surfactant. And then for the adult from septic shock, that is too much of, or too much of the liquid, correct? Yes, there is too much. Like, abnormally, water is coming inside your alveoli and diluting your surfactant. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. So that is surfactant. Okay, so mechanics of breathing, pulmonary ventilation consists of inspiration, inhalation and exhalation, that is expiration. And they are accomplished by alternating, increasing and decreasing volume of thorax and lungs. So here you go. The inspiratory muscles during quiet breathing is external intercoastal and the diaphragm. You see, this is the diaphragm and external intercoastal. Internal exter external intercoastal doesn't work during the quiet breathing, okay? So inspiration occurs mainly because, here, can you see my hand? Our diaphragm is like dome shape. So here is diaphragm. When it contracts, diaphragm flattens and it goes down. And in, uh, I have posted the uh, lab recording and you can see I have talked about this there too. So watch that video too. So when diaphragm contract, it goes down. And when this external intercoastal muscles contract, they pull this rib case outward. So your rib cage is going outward, your diaphragm is going downward. If I do that, I am increasing or decreasing the volume of your thoracic cavity. You're increasing? I'm increasing the volume of your thoracic cavity. So if everything is constant, and if I increase the volume of your thoracic cavity, that means I am increasing the volume of your lungs too, because lungs is also expanding. Clear? Yes. If I increase the volume, if I increase the volume of the lungs, that means I am expanding the lungs. So what happens the pressure inside the lungs? Pressure will go down or pressure will go up? It will down. Go up. down. Pressure will go down. And if pressure is lower inside the lungs, your lungs is connected to your nose. So air will come in. Come in. And that is inspiration. So inspiration is due to contraction of diaphragm and external intercoastal muscle, which increase uh, thoracic cavity volume, which decrease pressure inside the lungs, which help air coming inside the lungs, and that is inspiration. And who said that if you increase a volume of any chamber, if you increase the volume, and if you keep the content air, same amount, you decrease the pressure. Who said that? Boyles, Mr. Boyle said that. That's why that is 
Boyle's principle, okay? Now, how at rest, so we are breathing in and breathing out, how at rest we breathe out then? Breathe out is just normal relaxation of muscle. So these muscles, external intercostal and the diaphragm and some para, inter, uh, para external intercostal too. They relax back, they contract back again. After the contraction, they relax age. So the, your ribs comes together, your diaphragm goes up and you increase the volume and you exhale. So that is just expression is just due to passive recoil of the same muscles, okay? Deep breathing, during the deep breathing, other muscles works like scalenes, pectoralis minor, sternocleidomastoid, and ex expiration when there is forceful expiration, like then you'd use internal intercostal muscle too. Otherwise in quiet breathing, it is only two major muscles, okay? So this is the mechanics of pulmonary ventilation. You, this, is, this is rest. The atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeter of mercury inside the lungs. At rest, you have intrapulmonary pressure, which is equal to atmospheric pressure that is 760 millimeter of mercury. But inside the pleura, you have a still, what? Pressure is, what? Still negative six. But during inspiration, what happens? Inside the lungs, you have 757, which is three less than atmospheric. Inside the pleura, we have 754. So which is almost six negative. Expiration, the pressure is higher, three plus than atmospheric. And, but pleura still is 57, okay? Inside the pleura. So it is still positive. And that's why it later uh, inflate again. Okay, so uh, to measure the ventilation, means flow of air from your nose to your alveoli, that is ventilation. Whether air is flowing properly or not is the function of your respiratory system. And then where air is going in Side your cardiovascular system is the function of both respiratory system and cardiovascular system because they are connected. That's why, have you seen, how many of you have seen COPD patient, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patient? If they are severe case, look at their body, look at their face, look at their leg, look at their body. They have swelling. They are always, they have heart problems because when you have a respiratory problem, you will have heart problem too because they are interconnected with each other, okay? So whether your respiratory tract is working properly or not, we do pulmonary function test and that is assessed, checked clinically by measurement of flow of air in and out and that is called spirometry. Spirometry is a method that measures volume of air moved during inspiration and expiration. Inspiration, <sighs> expiration. I am doing intentionally, but it is happening automatically. Let me test your knowledge now. Autonomic breathing is going in and out of our breathing is happening without your conscious mind. Which part of the central nervous system is doing that? Autonomic. Autonomic. Which part, which organ of the central nervous system? Brainstem. The medulla. medulla. Brainstem, medulla. Good. Medulla and the pons. Okay. So, anatomical data space is air in conducting zone where no gas exchange occurs. So when you are taking air, your whole respiratory tract is filled with air. But from nose to the terminal bronchioles, you are not exchanging gases. That volume of air in the respiratory tract is called anatomical data space because 
these space do not exchange the gases. Okay, so here is the graph of a spirometry. I want you guys to look at it first and then I'm gonna explain. Okay, so spirometry, this graph is produced by spirometry. The, uh, the, the respiratory therapist or the nurse will ask you to put a cannula in your mouth and then that is connected to the spirometer, spirometer and you they ask you to normal breathe and then breathe with force and then inhale with force and air is getting out of your mouth and then through the machine, and then machine is connected to the computer and then computer, the pointer there is writing or drawing the flow of air on the paper or inside the computer screen. And that is the spirometry, spirometry graph. So here is time in the X axis and in the Y axis you have lung volume in cubic centimeter. Okay, so it is zero, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, and 6,000. Okay, milliliter, like means six liter. So if you see when you breathe quietly, this red line, inhalation, when you go up, inhalation, down, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation. So this inhalation is 500 ml, exhalation is also 500 ml. And these volumes are called tidal volume, okay? So tidal volume is amount of air expired each breath in quiet breathing, per breath in quiet breathing. Last time when I went over per breath, per ventricular contraction, that means one ventricular contraction. That was the stroke volume and some of you got confused. So this sign means per, that means each ventricular contraction, each breathing, okay? So each time, let's see, I inhale one time. I exhale one time, that is each time and that is called the tidal volume, okay? We breathe around 12 to 15 times per minute. Now, let's see here, we are breathing air and then we are breathing out and then we can breathe more with force. Try after normal breathing out, try forcing more breathing. So what happens? You can breathe more, more and more up to here, which is almost thousand ml here. This amount is called, you see, expiratory reserve volume. You see the line here? So from here up to the here, or from here to here, this is called expiratory reserve volume. So let's say you take normal breathing, breathe out, breathe with force. Do you think you can exhale all air from your respiratory tract? No. no. no still there is some volume left and that is called residual, residual volume. Are you following me? So residual volume is leftover volume inside your respiratory tract with maximum the uh, exhalation. Okay, now Again, let's go and breathe in and breathe out. So we have breathe in, up, breathe out, breathe in, and then breathe with force as much as you can. You can breathe up to here. So this amount from here to here, you see? Inspiratory reserve volume. Okay? Now, so you take tidal volume, 
you exhale as much as you can. No, let's go this way. So inhale and then you go, ex inhale as much as you can. And then you inhale, uh, exhale and then exhale as much as you can. And then measure all. So tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume and expiratory reserve volume. It's called vital capacity. And after the tidal volume, whatever is left in the lungs, it's called functional residual volume. And total volume of your lungs, including the residual volume, is called total lung capacity. So in this graph, you can see there are some of them are volume and some of them are capacities. So volumes are one measurement and capacity is two or more than two volumes when they are added. Clear? I just got a quick question, Dr. Shah. Go ahead. This is me just asking about the total lung capacity. So at any point in time, even when we're like working out super hard, none of us are actually using our lungs to their absolute full capacity. Yes. So like normally when we are uh, <clears throat> normally breathing in and breathing out, still we have total lung capacity going on. Like air, that amount of air is all the time there. Gotcha. Okay. And these are the terms used to describe lung volumes and capacities. Whatever I described, they are here and you can go over them. So here are lung volume, total tidal volume, inspiratory reserve volume, expiratory reserve volume, residual volume, lung capacities are total lung capacity, vital capacity, inspiratory capacity, and functional residual capacity. So you can go and these definition, you may be asked directly in the lecture questions, okay? Pulmonary disorders. Pulmonary disorders are lung disease, and you know there are several lung disease. That is called, the lung disease can be disease of the, any problem from the lung, nose to the alveoli, or disease can be on the wall of thoracic cavity, which restrict the expansion of the thoracic cavity. So pulmonary disorder, in broad, broad category can be classified into uh, obstructive lung disorder and restrictive lung disorder, okay? So restrictive lung disorders are characterized by reduced vital capacity. Vital capacity means the total lung volume is reduced basically, but with normal force battle, uh, vital capacity, okay? An example is pulmonary fibrosis. Pulmonary fibrosis means you remember in the lungs, we have alveoli, we have other connective tissue, we have elastic fibers. So if our lungs are fibrosed, which is replaced by fibrous connective tissue, then elastic fibers will be less and then our lungs will be less expanding and volume will be reduced. That is lung fibrosis. And that happens with a lot of uh, the, the anti-cancer therapy, some uh, fibrotic disease like uh, the mesothelioma or coal industry, people who is working in the coal industry, coal industry, they suffer from lung fibrosis and that can cause restrictive lung disorder or any neurological disorder of the, uh, the, the, the thoracic cavity wall, okay? Whereas obstructive disorder is obstruction to the flow of air. So, it takes longer time to take the same amount of air and it also take longer time to exhale the same amount of air. And that's why what happens then, if it taking longer time to inhale and exhale, that means you are trapping the air inside the alveoli. So if you trap, then what happens? A lot of carbon dioxide from your blood will build up in your alveoli and then that will be give back pressure in your pulmonary capillaries. More carbon dioxide will build up in your pulmonary artery, pulmonary capillaries in your blood, more carbon dioxide will cause more hydrogen ion and you will suffer from respiratory acidosis, which is bad for our body, okay? And obstructive disorders are several. They are COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is the group of disease and they are 
uh, bronchial asthma, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. So how we differentiate obstructive disorder from restrictive disorder? So obstructive disorder has flow disorder. Restrictive disorder has volume disorder, okay? That's why obstructive disorder is diagnosed by tests such as force expiratory volume that measures rate of expiration. So in this graph, which was not in the, our spirometry, this is the calculated graph, which is done by machine. We cannot measure it directly. So in this case, what we measure? We measure FEV1. FEV1 is the one second force expiratory volume, FEV1, okay? So you see here, this is the graph time and this is the volume. So here is two graph, the first graph A, uh, B and the second A. In the first second, the normal expiration is like the five liter, okay? And during the first second in A, he is expiring only 1.8 liter and B is expiring 2.5 liter. So the calculation FV1 for A is 80% and B is 62%, okay? So A looks normal and B looks abnormal because B uh, has less than 70% of uh, the FEV1. So if, FEV, if normally FEV1 is 90%, and if it is less than 70%, then we call it uh, the, uh, the, the restrictive disorder, okay? Sorry, obstructive disorder. This is the same thing here. The asthma is in, uh, induced by all the allergic substances from uh, the environment, from drugs, from cold, from inflammation, from mucus, and that cause bronchoconstriction and reduced diameter of the bronchi, and that causes the disease, okay? So here pulmonary disorders, some histology of the pulmonary disorder. This is the normal lung. You can see alveoli, intact, simple squamous epithelium, and here is damaged alveoli, okay? We talked about this pulmonary, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease involves chronic inflammation accompanied by narrowing of airways and obstruction of alveolar walls. And the, most of the people with COPD are the, <coughs> COPD are smokers. Uh, rest, restrictive disorder are due to pulmonary fibrosis and some, uh, are caused by black lung disease, which is called anthracosis from coal dust. So these are all in the first part of the respiratory system. Here you go. This is important one of the thing. When you take like a nebulizer and check your nebulizer machine every time now you use, See the particles of, sometimes we do for just satisfaction, we inhale. And if you see the particles are like 10 micrometer, that will not reach down and it will not work, okay? So the particle size must be less than five micrometer. And then they can reach inside your lower part of the respiratory tract and relax your bronchi and help in inhalation, okay? So this is all we talked about, the anatomy, histology of the alveoli, and then a spirometry and some restrictive and obstructive disorder of the lungs. Okay, so I'm gonna...